Hello, I'm Caroline Cruz, President and CEO of the Platelet Disorder Support Association. Welcome to ITP Insights, a series of webinars bringing disease education to patients, caregivers, and their families, featuring expert clinicians and researchers discussing critical topics in immune thrombocytopenia. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this program series, Argenix, Dova, and Principia, a Sanofi company. Today's first webinar will focus on COVID-19 and ITP, vaccines and viruses. Concern from the ITP community has continued as additional cases of apparent immune thrombocytopenia following COVID-19 vaccination have made the news. PDSA and its Medical Advisory Board are committed to the timely sharing of important information and developing helpful resources surrounding the coronavirus pandemic and how it's impacting our patient community. PDSA has continued to update our COVID-19 and ITP hub on the PDSA website, including updated consensus statements from our Medical Advisory Board, news stories related to ITP and COVID, and a link to our COVID-19 and ITP research survey. If you or someone you care for has had this COVID virus or the vaccine, we would appreciate it if you would take the time to fill out this survey so we can track reactions to both the infection and the vaccine. These experiences can help us understand if these COVID-19 agents affect platelet counts and bleeding events to determine if ITP patients have unique risks for adverse events. Later in the program, we'll be joined by several PDSA medical advisors, including Drs. Doug Seens and Terry Gernsheimer, who will answer your vaccine questions live. But first, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator for this program, PDSA medical advisor, Dr. James Bussell from Cornell University in New York City, as a renowned ITP expert, Dr. Bussell has been interviewed by several news outlets in the past couple of weeks, in addition to authoring a publication describing the connection between the COVID vaccines and ITP. His co-author, Dr. Lee, will also join us to share some of their research findings. Also joining us today is a leading expert in vaccine research and development, Dr. Sally Permar, who recently came from Duke to become the chair of pediatrics at Weill Cornell Medicine and pediatrician in chief at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center. Dr. Permar, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Bussell, could you introduce Dr. Permar to our audience? It gives us great pleasure today to present a webinar for PDSA on the vaccine role of vaccines in the COVID crisis and how that might or might not affect people who already have thrombocytopenia. To describe and discuss the vaccines, we have the great pleasure of having Sally Permar, who's newly started at Weill Cornell as the Nancy Paduano professor and chair of pediatrics and Presbyt at Weill Cornell Medicine and pediatrician in chief at New York Presbyterian Hospital at the Weill Cornell campus. Dr. Permar is a physician scientist, as you will hear in the near future. She did her undergraduate training at Davison, then um, went to the Harvard Medical School and did a PhD in microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, but also has worked at Beth Israel Deaconess, where one of the leading uh, US labs in vaccine biology exists. She has received a number of prestigious investigator awards uh, almost, or maybe too many to name. She, her work is primarily in neonatal immunity related to viruses, especially HIV and CMV, and what affects their transmission from the mother 
and how to develop a vaccine that will take advantage of this. Therefore, we are especially happy to have her with us. And Dr. Pramar, we look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bustel and um, to Caroline for inviting me on this um, important um, webinar for your um, uh, participants and, and interest, interest group here in the, um, how vaccines are both protecting us, but also may um, have some risk for some individuals. So I will um, start my sharing now of my presentation. Great. So um, I'll give an update here on the SARS-CoV-2 um, prevention through vaccination. Um, also touch a little bit on um, how uh, this is evolving into understanding, will we need more than one vaccine against SARS-CoV-2? So just to highlight where we are um, in terms of case counts throughout the US um, with SARS-CoV-2 is um, we've had a significant decline from the holiday surge in uh, December and in January. However, we're still one of the leading uh, developed nations in terms of case numbers. But great news is that the vaccine rollout is happening. And um, it it's certainly um, seems to be what was a, a very big bottleneck at first for being able to access vaccines, seems to be um, uh, easing. And uh, it's really predicted that by around April or so, if you want a vaccine, you'll be able to get a vaccine. And that's really exciting. Now, this is uh, a just momentous and really, um, to me, an unbelievable um, historic medical breakthrough to have these vaccines here um, to uh, fight a disease that we didn't know existed um, a year ago, where um, it took a process that is typically, sorry, um, typically uh, 10 or more years in length of um, uh, developing a vaccine um, usually the uh, preclinical development or, or testing in the laboratory and in animals, and then the initial phases of clinical development can take up to 10 years. Uh, then all of the phases of clinical trials are another two to four or more years. And then, of course, the manufacturing of a vaccine to get into every arm that needs it um, takes another number of years. And all of that was basically put into one year um, timeline. Uh, where we have now three approved uh, vaccines, two of them, um, the mRNA platform here from Moderna and from Pfizer. And one is a viral vector vaccine um, from Oxford and Ast AstraZeneca. And we have two others that are on the horizon with Johnson & Johnson, another viral vector vaccine that's been submitted to the FDA and Novavax that is um, uh, imminently going to be submitted to FDA. And really this was all done through a large amount by funding. Um, uh, a considerable amount of funding went into speeding um, these vaccines, as well as um, applying processes in parallel, um, that the clinical testing and development went forward before we um, uh, knew that the vaccines worked, they were being manufactured at a high level uh, for human use. And that has never um, been a strategy that's been employed before. And that led to a lot of the, um, being able to cut the time while not cutting the safety evaluations. But you know what these vaccines are really after is um, what we call neutralizing antibodies. And those neutralizing antibodies um, target the spike protein or this red protein on the surface of the virus. And what those uh, antibodies do is prevent the spike protein from um, binding to a human cell through the receptor for the virus, which is called the ACE2 receptor. And so uh, blocking the virus really depends on antibodies that will prevent that process. And to review one of the most successful vaccines that is as the one, um, uh, one of the ones that is most in use right now is the Moderna mRNA vaccine. And just to review here, and this is very similar to the Pfizer uh, platform as well, what is an mRNA vaccine? So an mRNA vaccine um, is, it's providing the genetic code for the uh, coronavirus spike protein, the red protein that was on the surface on the previous uh, slide. Um, it provides that genetic code for our own cells to be able to make that protein. 
that um, genetic code is encapsulated in what's called a lipid nanoparticle. And the lipid nanoparticle allows um, attachment of this vaccine to a human cell, usually a muscle cell, where the vaccine is, um, is injected. Um, that mRNA then goes to um, the part of the cell that produces protein called the ribosome. And then your own uh, cells will put the uh, protein on the surface of the cells. And your immune system will then start to respond to this as a foreign protein. And, and our immune systems are designed to respond to foreign proteins. And so um, while a lot of previous vaccines would just provide um, this protein directly to the muscle, we, this mRNA platform takes advantage of using the cellular machinery that's in all of our human cells to produce the protein for, for us instead of producing the protein in a laboratory. And here's really the remarkable data that came out of the clinical trials. Um, these, you know, first five or so vaccines and one um, from, uh, uh, that was initiated in Russia as well, have um, provided um, mostly two doses the Johnson & Johnson being the only one that has um, gone forward with one dose. Um, uh, the large numbers of participants in the trials, um, anywhere between about 10 to um, over 20,000. This yellow box really shows how, sorry, how, the, um, how remarkable the prevention of death is in all of these trials. Um, the vaccines were completely um, preventative against any death in the um, vaccinees in those trials. And of course, we know that um, the high death rate from uh, coronavirus is the reason why we, um, you know, pursued vaccines with such urgency. Um, also, uh, the protection against severe disease was also almost 100% in all of these um, uh, trials, preventing hospitalization, which has also been part of the crisis with COVID-19. The efficacy was also very impressive for um, this, these vaccines. With the mRNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer, uh, 94 and 95%, almost unheard of in clinical trials, um, really remarkable. Um, these are, puts them in some of the most effective vaccines that we know of. Um, the measles vaccine would be one that comes close to this. Uh, AstraZeneca came uh, uh, just below that at 90% for one of their trials, 70% um, for another um, part of their trials, depending on the dose they used. Johnson & Johnson achieved about 72%, and then Novavax, um, 89%. Um, however, in these trials that were done a little bit later than the Moderna and Pfizer trials, um, a, a potential concern showed up that there seemed to be lower efficacy in certain countries where new variants were circulating, like South Africa and Latin America. And I'll talk about that on the next slide, where um, what we know is that this is an RNA virus and an RNA virus is um, apt to mutate. Um, so it um, carries with it machinery to replicate its genome, but it's not near as uh, error-free compared to those types of enzymes that exist in our own cells. And so what, it, what started as the Wuhan strain of the virus, um, this is a, um, uh, showing the virus sequencing across time um, of the different coronaviruses in, in different geographic locations. That initially, this, the uh, sequence of the um, coronavirus changed pretty dramatically from these uh, very similar viruses became one fixed mutation that occurred in the spike protein that led to this uh, larger bubble here, which demonstrates all of the current sequencing of the coronavirus include uh, that mutation. From, from that um, founder variant, what started to happen is more mutations represented by these arrows especially in the spike protein. The spike protein is represented its structure over here on the right and uh, pointing out as some of the mutations that have started to occur in those uh, viruses. And what's happening here is basically there is an evolution of this spike protein in response to antibodies that it comes in contact with in um, an infected individual. And I'll give you an example of that on the next slide. The next slide uh, really talks about where might these variants have been coming from. And this is one um, patient story, which um, is, is representative of, of where we think those, um, the, the virus and the immune system are really evolving. Uh, here coming from the New England Journal um, a couple months ago, this is a um, example of a 45 year old 
with an autoimmunity that was treated with steroids and other B-cell immunosuppressants. So, so pretty um, immune suppressed individual. Um, like many uh, of patients with ITP and other platelet disorders um, may have beyond similar therapy. Um, this patient was hospitalized with COVID, had respiratory disease, but was discharged. Then um, experienced two separate resurgences of COVID-like symptoms with worsening respiratory disease. And if you can see the, the graph here of that um, individual's virus levels in the, in the nose sampling, um, each time the person was re-hospitalized, the virus levels had gone up. And when they sequenced that virus, so this circle represents all the coronavirus sequencing across um, different countries, but in brown here is that individual's virus that started to develop, develop more and more mutations as it evolved with the patient's um, immune system that wasn't able to completely control the virus replication. So that's an example of where mutations may be developing. And here's um, a, a busy slide, but a rundown of three different variants um, that have been um, circulating widely, um, UK variant, South Africa, and Brazil. And, and what's important is to go down to, are they still responsive to the vaccine elicited antibodies? And uh, from the UK, uh, we haven't seen any uh, um, inability of the uh, vaccine antibodies to um, neutralize it, which is good news. However, for the other two variants, South Africa and Brazil, there is some resistance to the vaccine elicited responses uh, from these variants. And so the question we're left with now is, will the neutralizing antibodies that are elicited by the vaccines be high enough to protect against these new variants, or will we need new vaccines for this type of new variant? So this kind of comes to the question of how many SARS-CoV-2 vaccines will we need? Um, one good piece of news is the, the most prevalent vaccine being used now, or the mRNA-based vaccine, is very well suited for rapid development of additional variants. Um, their uh, other platforms, including protein vaccines and viral vectors are also moving forward with including new variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in their vaccine. And this is actually a very common strategy that's used. So when we get the influenza vaccine, it's not just one strain of influenza, we actually get a quadrivalent vaccine with four strains of influenza. Um, HPV, uh, the human papillomavirus, same thing, more than one strain is included. Same with pneumococcus, a pneumonia vaccine, up to 23 strains are included there. So it's actually a very common strategy. And flu vaccine um, uh, strategy that goes on every year is actually a model for what the coronavirus vaccination strategy may, uh, may come around to, where um, that includes global uh, sequencing and surveillance of um, the variants throughout the, the country and the, and the world, and then development of a vaccine annually based on uh, what that um, surveillance has shown. And you don't need new clinical trials once the whole process is approved by the FDA. But a real question might be, is a coronavirus vaccine possible um, that would uh, protect against all variants of coronavirus? Because we know um, even uh, before SARS-CoV-2 uh, hopped into the human population, there were two other similar um, respiratory viruses that had more limited um, transmission that were also fairly deadly. And so um, making a vaccine that may protect against all coronaviruses is um, a, a great desire. Um, this is gonna require a lot of basic science and here just showing one of the strategies of reverse vaccinology where um, you study the antibodies that are isolated from patients that have a good response to the coronavirus and that may be able to neutralize more than one of the coronavirus strains and then use knowledge from those antibodies to uh, design a vaccine that is able to neutralize more than one uh, form of the coronavirus. So just to close, um, how can we end this pandemic and how can we prevent the next? So for now, we need to vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. Uh, we need to get as many people immune uh, as possible. And right now in the US, the um, gold standard is the mRNA vaccine. And we'll see as the um, viral vector vaccines like Johnson & Johnson are approved, where those will start to fit in. I also added that we need to study any rare side effects, which is why you're having this uh, call today is about um, whether there are certain populations that may be more susceptible to a rare side effect when uh, there've been pretty remarkable uh, safety of these mRNA vaccines. That doesn't mean they're, they're without any kind of side effect. And as was noted um, in, in potentially affecting um, uh, platelet, platelet disorders. Um, we need to continue masking, distancing, and limiting groups to avoid more transmissible variants that also could be less sensitive to the vaccines from taking over in our population. So um, we're not able to give up the masks yet. 
Um, I'm a pediatrician, so I know we need to vaccinate children and, and approve the vaccines for children, get them back in school, and then um, develop these new variant spike antigens and add them to current vaccine regimens as multivalent vaccines. And then um, continue the basic research on how to design a spike protein vaccine that would elicit antibodies that would be cross-protective against many strains of coronavirus and not just one. And so I'll end there and allow for any uh, questions. That, that was great, Sally. Um, Caroline, is it okay if I start with a question and then go over to you for some more patient-related questions? Um, the, the things I was wondering about are, the focus has been on vaccines to the spike protein. My understanding is that potentially the nucleocapsid protein or some of the other proteins don't mutate as much. Maybe that's because they're not under pressure. So I wondered if uh, subsequent vaccines might incorporate other components of the virus. And, and then um, let me hold the next question. Sure. So that's a good question because there are um, more than one viral protein and um, often in antibody tests for the virus, the nucleocapsid antibody response is tested for. And so it's a way we can diagnose that you've previously been infected with COVID. Um, however, that protein is not involved in the entry of the virus into a human cell. And um, while some of these studies are still pending um, uh, being released, what I think we're, we're realizing in all of the evidence is that really it comes down to that neutralizing antibody level um, as to whether you're protected or not. Um, and so that is gonna be completely dependent on the spike protein. Now, um, one piece though I will say is um, the other type of uh, other arm of our immune system is the cellular um, arm of the immune system, the T cells um, in particular, and they may be able to boost vaccine responses and could include non-surface proteins like the nucleocapsid. And so a T cell based vaccine may want to target those types of responses. Caroline? Yeah, Dr. Permar, that was a great presentation. Thank you. And we do have some questions, um, both general and COVID specific that we've received from our ITP community. But I wanted to ask you about something that you mentioned in your presentation. You talked about um, how these mutations develop specifically in people with autoimmune disease who are on immunosuppressive therapy. Um, so would that mean that it's even more important for patients with autoimmune disease or who are immunosuppressed to receive a vaccine? Yes. Um, so while um, individuals who are on immune suppressants may be expected to have a lower response to the vaccine because of some of the therapies they're receiving, um, it is important um, to get your vaccine um, you know, uh, as long as in consultation with your providers, et cetera, that um, everyone is, is in agreement, but it would be important to um, protect against um, coronavirus in people that have immune suppression for a couple of reasons. One is that you may be more susceptible to severe disease. We know that um, in some patients who are on immune suppressants, they are more likely to be hospitalized with the virus. And so for that reason, you wanna, you'd rather get the vaccine than the virus for sure. Um, and, and the other um, reason would be potentially this development of variants. So if your immune system um, is, um, when upon infection is not able to completely prevent virus replication in your own body, your uh, virus replication can be the source of mutations that would lead to new variants that then may be um, less able to respond to antibody responses in general. So, um, so immune suppressed people, like I showed in that um, presentation, could be more likely to develop the types of, of mutations in their virus that end up being new variants that may spread to other people and be more difficult to vaccinate against. So two really important reasons why um, people who are immune suppressed should absolutely seek vaccination as soon as possible. And if, if we take experience maybe with other vaccines, if you have some kind of reaction to the first injection, if you're getting more than one, how does that usually play into whether you should or shouldn't get the second one? 
Yeah, so there's been a lot of um, discussion on, you know, how many doses and also the, the side effects, the mostly mild side effects that we're seeing from the mRNA vaccines in particular. Um, so there is some debate as to whether people that have previously been infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus and then they get a vaccine, are they more likely to have those mild side effects of fever, muscle aches, some chills that generally last a day or a day and a half? Um, those, um, there's some debate and I think we're still waiting on the data to see if that's truly more common in someone who's been infected previously or not. Certainly we know that um, in the mRNA vaccine trials, the second dose of the mRNA vaccine always had a higher rate of individuals complaining of those mild side effects um, after the second dose. And I know I certainly was with them in my second dose. <laughs> I certainly felt the, the day of, you know, feverish and not wanting to do much. Um, but um, so, so it is important though, even if you have a reaction on your first um, dose and, and by reaction, I mean um, that you have something mild that can be treatable with Tylenol or ibuprofen or staying in bed that day. That would be the mild um, treatment that, um, that we're talking about. We're not talking about an anaphylactic reaction where you need an EpiPen you know, to prevent your uh, throat swelling and, and very, you know, severe allergic reaction. So the, a, a reaction like that, you should work with your providers, et cetera, on how you should get vaccinated going forward. But if you have the mild side effects, which again are manageable on your own, then that's not a reason to not get the, uh, the second dose. And in fact, we're always recommending the second doses um, because again, if you have incomplete immunity, and you get infected with the coronavirus, you are uh, likely to contribute to the development of mutations that may uh, create a new variant that will be more difficult to vaccinate against. So having just one dose when two are recommended is really, is really problematic for the development of new variants that, that may cause us issues with vaccination in the future. And, and Dr. Permar, within the ITP patient community, of course, they're concerned with uh, you know, a drop in their platelet count after receiving the vaccine. Do you have reason to suspect that one of the vaccines would be safer for ITP patients, uh, patients with autoimmune disease or uh, who are in immunosuppressive therapy, uh, comparing the Pfizer, Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson, or even the AstraZeneca vaccines? Yeah, so this is a great question and I know really on the minds of um, those who are listening today. Um, so we know that when your body is exposed to a new, um, a new antigen, we call it, but a new protein to respond to, there can be autoimmune effects of that response to the foreign protein. And one of those potential autoimmune effects is, um, is uh, a drop in platelets. Um, like what happens in immune mediated thrombocytopenia. So, um, so it, it seems to be, as the numbers have shown, a very rare side effect of this SARS-CoV-2 vaccine so far. And, and that is with pretty good, pretty high numbers of people that have received it so far. So I think one thing we can feel good about is how rare this, uh, the ITP following um, vaccination is happening given the millions upon millions upon millions of doses that, that have been given to this point. Um, however, um, we know that, that there is a slight, slight risk that response to any kind of new um, uh, protein that your body is responding to can have this side effect. And in fact, I'm a pediatrician uh, like Dr. Bussell, and we see patients um, who are children that have gotten a, a virus, a new virus infection, and ended up with ITP. And so it's a similar uh, process. When you get a vaccine, you have a, maybe a small, small risk that, that your immune response will start responding to something it's not supposed to respond to. Um, however, I think, uh, so while this is a um, potential side effect of all vaccines, I don't think we're seeing more, and you guys can agree with me or not, uh, based on your, your platelet experience, I don't think we're seeing a higher rate of problems with um, platelet, platelet disorders after vaccination compared to any other vaccine. So that's the good news. Now, in terms of whether there's a certain vaccine that patients who already have autoimmune diseases or, or problems with their platelets should, should 
go for. Um, one thought would be that um, when the different vaccines are different in how many new proteins they are, um, they are displaying to your immune system. The mRNA vaccines only um, uh, target one protein, only give the immune system one new protein to respond to. Whereas the viral vector vaccines like the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson, they have other proteins that are coming from the virus that is carrying that spike protein to deliver it to your cells. And so that, that may be a consideration that maybe I only want my immune system to be uh, responding to one single protein, like in the mRNA vaccine, rather than a set of proteins that come along with the viral vector in addition to the spike genetic material that that virus is delivering. And then the Novavax, the protein vaccine would again just be one um, protein that your body is responding to. So I might consider that when choosing, if I had a choice of which, which vaccine to take. Caroline, do we have more time or no? Well, that's up to Dr. Permar. I do have one or two more questions if we can have a few more minutes of her time. I think we can go a couple more minutes. Well, I just have a, Jim, I just have a follow-up to, to what Dr. Permar just said. Um, of course, you know, patients, uh, some patients with ITP have had uh, a splenectomy. And so um, in, in patients who've had either a splenectomy or on immunosuppressive therapy um, or have autoimmune disease, um, how will we know if the vaccine works for them? Is there any type of uh, test or antibody test that they can take afterwards to determine that? That's a great question. And right now we, we really don't have a um, test to make sure you're immune to the virus. And, um, and I don't know that we will in the near, near future. Um, there are certain vaccines where we do test if you have immunity in certain situations like rubella vaccine, do, did you develop immunity? Because we need to know that when you go into pregnancy, because we want all pregnant women can, uh, protected against rubella so that they don't pass on the virus to their baby. Um, also for hepatitis B, for healthcare workers, we test you to see if you are immune before going into your healthcare worker job. So, um, so there are situations where we do that. At this point, we're not um, doing that for SARS-CoV-2. Um, but um, also know that there's, there's research going on now that will help establish what is the level of immunity that's actually protective. And that's a key piece of information because that will guide us on um, what should the vaccines be targeting. Um, and when these new variants come along, how much more immunity do we need or do we need different um, uh, types of immunity to protect against those variants? So there's work going on now to establish what is the level of antibodies or immunity that's needed to be protected, and that will better guide us in understanding how to move vaccination forward for the future. Could, could you amplify just one aspect of that? I happened to get the Pfizer vaccine and went for my monthly test and discovered I had no antibodies after the second one, and I was surprised, and then I realized they're testing for, as you mentioned briefly before, a different antibody so that currently conventional testing doesn't even find if you made an antibody. But ideally, if the different antibody test comes in, it might not tell you if it's neutralizing, but at least would tell you that you did something as opposed to nothing. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're bringing up the, you know, the, the specifics of the antibody tests that we have available. And you're right that some of our antibody testing, as I mentioned previously, is not against the spike protein, which is included in all the vaccines. The antibody testing may be against the nucleocapsid protein, a different protein of the virus that's not on the surface. So if you get a nucleocapsid antibody test after getting a spike protein vaccine, it will not be uh, positive. Um, but if you had coronavirus in the past, you may still have nucle nucleocapsid antibodies. Um, so, so yes, be, be wary of ordering an antibody test after a vaccine. Um, because first, first of all, it may not even be measuring the right type of response. Secondly, we don't really know what it means to say that you have antibodies positive, that we can measure that you have those antibodies, but not measure what the function is, because what we think is going to be the true protective level is going to come down to how uh, your antibodies are able to neutralize the virus, not just find that they're present. 
And just one final question. Is it important uh, if, a, if a patient or if a person happens to get a vaccine, let's say just a flu vaccine or a shingles vaccine, or happens to be infected with the, the COVID virus, should they wait a certain time period before they get the COVID vaccine? Yeah, so that's um, a great point. First, um, important to know that it's still recommended that you get the vaccine even if you've had COVID, um, because we've actually seen that the antibodies elicited by the vaccine seem to be more long lasting than that of the infection itself, at least with mild infection. So that's important to know. Um, but is there any um, reason you should delay your vaccine if you've had COVID in the past? Um, so I'll answer that first. Um, there's not a true um, recommendation right now. Mostly you should get a vaccine. If it's offered to you and your group is getting vaccinated, you should get a vaccine. But if you have a choice of when you might get it, um, there, are, there have been some that have suggested to wait at least two months after you had acute SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID because then your own responses to that uh, virus will come down and, and they won't mask the vaccine. Now we don't know if, if those antibodies truly do that or not. That's been true in other types of vaccines. So we're just being cautious there. Um, and there's not a true recommendation, but if you had a choice, maybe you would wait two months or at least a month after having your acute COVID. Now, what's truly recommended is if you got a monoclonal antibody therapy for COVID. So if you had an infusion of monoclonal antibodies, uh, like we saw some of our famous politicians get, um, then you should uh, not receive the vaccine for 90 days. So that's a clear cut recommendation. So, so know that. Then in terms of other vaccines, the only recommendation with other types of vaccines is to not get them within two weeks of your COVID vaccine. So if you need a flu shot or a single shot, just wait uh, two weeks in between each. Well, Dr. Permar, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, we really appreciate your insights and look forward to hearing more in the future. Um, Dr. Bussell, I'll let you have the last word. I don't have anything to add. That was great, Dr. Permar. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Well, a little later in the program, we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible. We have around 680 participants uh, on this webinar right now. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Bussell, my co-moderator, for helping me to organize this program today, uh, along with the rest of the PDSA staff. Um, I mentioned in my introduction that Dr. Bussell was interviewed by a number of news outlets, including the New York Times, which was viewed more than 900,000 times uh, about the cases of thrombocytopenia occurring after the COVID vaccine. Um, and Dr. Bussell and his colleague, Dr. Lee, have written a manuscript to be published about the association between uh, the COVID vaccine and thrombocytopenia. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Bussell, right now. Thank you very much, um, Caroline. I appreciate the opportunity. And the PDSA was all over the news as Caroline was a little too modest to mention, not only in the Times article, but in other uh, things. Dr. Lee, who I have had the great benefit of having join us at Wow Cornell several years ago, is going to review first the data on the people like the poor uh, physician in Florida um, who had never had ITP and developed thrombocytopenia, and then review more recent data that's not in the manuscript about patients who have had um, who have had ITP and received the vaccination. So she's going to take it from here. And then, as Caroline said, as many questions as possible will be answered. And hopefully some of them have been answered already by Dr. Permar. And I think you'll see that a number of them will be answered by Dr. Lee as well. So... Anju, if you're set to unmute yourself and share your screen, we would love to hear what you have to tell us. Okay, perfect. So hi everyone, my name is Anju Lee and I'm an assistant professor specializing in non-malignant hematology at Weill Cornell. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. And the topic of my presentation will be vaccination for COVID-19 and ITP. And I have no disclosures. So first we'll start with what's actually prompting this discussion. So as you're aware, in early January, USA Today published an article describing a 56 year old healthy male physician in Florida who passed away from a hemorrhagic stroke in the setting of severely low platelets occurring days after the COVID-19 vaccine. The story was then reported in the New York Times a few days later, as well as several additional news outlets. And then as several more weeks passed, as millions more Americans across the country were being vaccinated, additional cases of people with post-vaccine severe thrombocytopenia were presenting to the hospital, ultimately leading to this New York Times article, which was published on February 8th. This article was written by Denise Grady and describes a 72 year old woman who was hospitalized in Queens in mid to late January with a platelet count of zero, a few days following the COVID-19 vaccine. Thankfully, in this case, with Dr. Bussell's suggestions, her platelets improved to 40, then 71, and then 293, so this was a good outcome, and she was able to be discharged from the hospital. That article also mentioned an additional 30-something cases of severe thrombocytopenia following COVID-19 vaccines, suspicious for ITP, as reported in the CDC VAERS database. And again, following the February 8th article, additional news outlets shared this story across the US and across the world, leading to significant anxiety and worry amongst people in general, but in particular, those with people or people with low platelets to begin with, including those with ITP. So with all of this concern regarding COVID-19 vaccines and dangerously low platelet counts, we've been working with hematologists from across the country to gather some preliminary data to present to you tonight. The questions we hope to help answer or to help start answering, because again, things with COVID-19 are happening in real time and we don't have much data or the ability to make concrete conclusions, are one, what is the risk of developing severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccine in those without ITP? And two, what is the risk of an ITP flare post-vaccine in those with ITP? The outline of this talk will be as follows. So first we'll review data reported in VAERS. So VAERS stands for Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. Uh, this is a database run by the CDC, the FDA, and the Department for Health and Human Services. These are reports of adverse events that are filed by healthcare providers. To identify cases, I use search terms including immune thrombocytopenia, decreased platelets, hemorrhage, and petechia. The data I'll be reviewing with you tonight is based on last access of the database on February 5th. So this database updates every Friday. So my numbers are out of date compared to if you check today what you would find. Um, if you're interested in looking, I've uh, attached the link to that database on the slide. So after that, we'll review data from our own patients with ITP who had baseline and post-vaccination platelet counts done. This data will include patients from New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell, as well as centers from across the US. Although we're continuing to actively compile this data, the data in this presentation is what we had available as of February 19th. And lastly, I'll review data provided by the PDSA regarding patient reported experiences with the COVID-19 vaccines. So these are comments collected from the PDSA Facebook page with a date cutoff of February 15th. And although comments left since then are not included in this presentation, I do encourage you to continue posting as any and all information we can continue to collect will be highly valuable. So starting with the VAERS cases, many of you read the second New York Times article published on February 8th, which referenced 36 patients identified in VAERS who sounded suspicious for ITP post-vaccine. When I looked at those records myself, and again, this is as of February 5th, I only found 20. And that discrepancy could be because I only included patients who had actual platelet counts reported. I omitted those who had concomitant medical issues, including active infections, which could also cause platelets to decrease. And several of those reports were duplicates. Of the 20 cases we found, 11 were women, eight were men, and one report did not include an age or a gender. And ages ranged from 22 to 73 with a median of 41 years. Nine of these 20 patients had received the COVID, uh, Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine and 11 received the Moderna. Of the 20 people with severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccine, the majority or 19, this occurred after the first dose and one report was um, reported after the second dose of the vaccine. 
Most patients reported symptoms, including petechia, bruising, and bleeding within 10 days of vaccination with a median of five days. Most had very, very low platelet counts of less than 10 with a median of two, and all 20 patients were hospitalized. So although this is sounding extremely scary, something that I wanna emphasize is that at that point, so this is end of January, very start of February, around 20 million people were vaccinated. The initial clinical trials of these vaccines included more than 70,000 people and had no reports of severe thrombocytopenia. Again, this is to emphasize the incredibly rare occurrence of this event. Also going forward since February 5th, we have heard of a few additional cases of severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccine, including one I saw in the hospital about a week and a half ago. But again, this is in the setting of over 1.5 million vaccinations per day in the U.S. So this is a little bit hard to read, but this is a table of all 20 patients who we identified in VAERS, including demographics, medical history if available, platelet counts, treatments, and outcomes. So there are a few things that I wanna highlight in the next few slides. The first question, which is per pertinent to our audience tonight is how many of these people with severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccination had pre-existing ITP? Although this is a very small sample of 20 patients, the answer is not many. So one patient had a reported history of ITP in remission prior to the vaccine. And this is what I highlighted in the yellow box over here. In addition, two other patients were reported to have histories of low platelet counts at some point. So one had a previous platelet count at 145 at some point prior to the vaccine. And the other had platelets of 55 and 115 in 2019, although they did not carry labels of ITP. The other person with decreased platelets is this 36-year-old woman who had an inherited or a genetic cause for low platelets. The rest, so that was 16 patients, had no reported history of ITP or low platelets. The next question is, so what happened to these patients with the very low platelet counts following the vaccines and what treatments did they receive? So again, illustrating some of their limitations of the various reports, the only data we have is what providers share in the reports. Treatments were described in 15 out of 20 cases and outcomes were reported in 20 of 16, sorry, in 16 of 20 cases. So treatments were described in 15 of 20 and outcomes reported in 16 of 20. Again, it's a little bit hard to see, but in this yellow box over here, I wanted to highlight um, the treatments that the patients had received in addition to the outcomes. So most patients were treated with a combination of intravenous immune globulin or IVIG steroids with or without platelet transfusions. Of the 16 patients where we had outcomes reported, 14 responded to these traditional ITP treatments. One patient did not have a platelet improvement as of the date in the VAERS report, and this was three days into his hospital course, but also the treatments provided were not included in that report. The other patient who did not respond is the index patient. So the 56 year old physician who unfortunately passed away with the cerebral hemorrhage. He had received IVIG steroids, uh, rituximab and platelet transfusions. So to summarize the VAERS data and our preliminary insights, again, only one of the 20 patients who we identified with severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccine had pre-existing or known ITP but there were two additional people with decreased platelet counts in the past. So that one person with platelets of 145 and the other with platelets of 55 and 115. Um, and then there was another patient who had the inherited or genetic cause for low platelets. Although our data is small and limited, at least we're not seeing ITP present in the majority of people who presented with severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccine. It's also reassuring that people who had the very low platelets after the vaccine seem to respond to traditional ITP treatments, which include IVIG and steroids. Of those people who responded, 13 responded pretty quickly. So within one to three days after IVIG steroids with or without platelet transfusions, one patient did not respond immediately and also received rituximab, tipo agonist, and vincristine ultimately with improvement. And that one patient who did not respond immediately is the woman who was described in that New York Times report. So switching gears a little bit from the various patients to our own experiences, 
We have a collaboration of hematologists from across the country. And as of February 19th, we have a shared 23 patients with ITP who have received at least the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine and have platelet counts pre and post vaccination. So far, this includes patients from New York City, Washington, and California. Of the 23 patients, 17 are women and six are men. The ages range from 23 to 82 with a median of 71 years. 13 people in the sample are at least 65 years old, and this reflects the priority groups for vaccination. Nine people received the Pfizer vaccine and 14 received Moderna. 22 patients had received their first dose and one person received both doses. Most of these people, so 18 of 23, were on TPO agonists, including, T or, sorry, were on ITP treatment. So again, 18 of 23 were on ITP treatments, which included TPO agonists as well as Salcept. Uh, four people were not on any treatments, and in one patient, we did not have treatment um, information available. So this graph looks pretty busy, but basically I'm trying to show you for each of these patients, their platelets pre and post COVID-19 vaccine. So the pre um, COVID-19 vaccine platelet counts are over here and the post um, vaccine platelet counts are over here. Each line represents one patient and we have 23 patients. So we have uh, 23 lines, again, pre-vaccine and then post-vaccine. Pre-vaccination counts for these patients range from 59 to 666. Again, pre-vaccine platelet counts are over here um, with a mean or average count of 193 and a median of 122. Post-vaccination counts are over here and they um, range from 20 to 949 with a mean of 213 and a median of 150. Post-vaccination counts were checked about one week following the vaccination. So if you follow each line, um, you'll see that 10 patients actually had an increase in their platelet counts post-vaccination with an average change from baseline of 110%. And 13 patients had a decrease in their counts post-vaccination with an average percent change from baseline of negative 72%. So we're seeing both increases and decreases in platelet counts following the vaccine. Here, I've omitted the patients with pre-vaccination platelet counts higher than 300, um, and this allows us to see the data a little bit better for those 19 patients with pre-vaccine platelet counts of less than 300. Again, each line represents one patient, and it's pre- and post-vaccine, and we see uh, both platelets rising and falling after the vaccine. In general, we don't see dramatic changes, nor do we see a trend for everyone to fall. So going back to that full graph of 23 patients, I wanted to focus on the cases where the platelets dropped as this is one of our main concerns. So in terms of platelet nators, two patients had post-vaccination counts of less than 30. So there are these two over here. Um, one had a count of 20 and the other had a count of 28, but these patients also started with lower counts of 50 to 70 uh, pre-vaccine. I don't have follow-up information for these uh, patients yet. Thankfully, there were no patients so far in our group of 23 who had their platelets fall to less than 10. So I know the next question will be, if people do well with their first dose, what about the second dose? And on the other hand, if platelets fall with the first dose, what should we do with the second dose? So as of yet, this is still an unresolved question. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is as presented earlier in this talk, there was one person in the VAERS data set who presented with severe thrombocytopenia following the second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so it is a valid concern. Unfortunately, at this point, I don't have much data to share with you in, re in regards to our ITP patients and how they do with the second dose. That said, people are starting to be scheduled for their second doses. Um, we're actively gathering this data. And even as of last week, I had people uh, go in on Friday and Saturday for their second doses and I'm expecting their platelet counts this week. So again, just emphasizing that we are still in the active data collection phase. Uh, these are early reports and we can't make conclusions or generalizations based on these data. But in general, we are seeing some, um, for our patients, we're seeing some with platelets rising post-vaccine and others with platelets dropping. So far, we haven't yet seen severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccine in our ITP patients, um, but we did have two patients with platelet nators of less than 30. Um, there was that one patient from the VARES data set who had pre-existing ITP and had platelets fall to two post-vaccine. 
We're actively collecting data on second doses of vaccines, but this early data appears very reassuring, as in we're not seeing the majority of our patients with significant platelet drops post-vaccine. So switching gears for the last time now, we'll now review the data provided by the PDSA. So these are comments from ITP patients posted to the PDSA Facebook page describing their personal experiences with the COVID-19 vaccines. As of February 15th, there were 63 comments. I included 61 comments in the analysis for the next two slides, or so the next few slides. The two comments I omitted, one um, was expressing uncertainty about the vaccine. And although that's a very valid concern, I just wanted to focus on those who had already received the vaccines. Um, the second comment we'll review in the next um, few slides, but I think there was a typo in that comment. Ultimately, uh, 12 people had received both doses of the vaccine. I divided the responses into a few categories. So those who did well had no abnormal bleeding or bruising, but also didn't have a platelet count checked. Those who did well had their platelets checked and the platelets were stable, rose, or minimally decreased. Those who had their platelets checked and the platelets dropped more significantly, but the nadir still remained greater than 30. And then two concerning categories, one of people who had new bleeding and bruising um, after the vaccine, but hadn't yet had their platelets checked. And then those who had their platelets drop more, more significantly with a nadir of less than 30. So in this pie graph, I've um, highlighted the data that we have uh, based on that PDSA data. So I consider the categories in this yellow box as good outcomes or reasonably good outcomes. So we had 35 people who did well, didn't have any uh, bleeding or bruising, but also didn't have a platelet count checked. And that is the majority of our patients at 35 out of 61. The second group that we considered a good outcome was this group in the orange. So these people did well and they had their platelets checked and the platelets either rose were stable, remained within normal range, or minimally decreased, and that was 21 people. Here in the gray, I would also consider this as a relatively good um, response, as in the platelets didn't drop uh, to less than 30. So these were three people who had their platelets drop after the vaccine, but the nadir remained greater than 30. So I know a lot of people are curious about actual platelet counts following the vaccine, um, so we'll look at these 21 people who had their platelets checked a little bit um, in further detail. So eight had described um, that their platelets rose following the vaccine. And then there were 13 people who described that their platelets were stable, were still re within normal range, decreased by less than 50, or per report, decreased by a little. So although the majority of people seemed to do well, there were two out of the 20, two out of the 61 um, respondents who described concerning experiences. So there was one person who had a new nosebleed following the vaccine and was waiting for a platelet count to be checked. And another person who had a baseline count of around 60 that dropped to 11 following the second dose of the vaccine. Unfortunately, I don't have follow-up information for those two cases. So this is a summary of the PDSA COVID-19 vaccine experience. It seems like most people did well or reasonably well um, without abnormal bleeding or bruising or without significant decreases in their platelet counts following the vaccines. Um, just to mention again, the two comments that I excluded from the analysis, um, one was this person who was just expressing uncertainty about the vaccine and didn't actually have the vaccine yet. The other one, I think there was a typo. Um, this person was describing the Oxford vaccine and the platelet count being one, but feeling fine with a sore arm. So I wonder if the platelets were really one and they were asymptomatic or if there was a typo. So due to that, I didn't include that response into the previous graph. So we've gone through quite a bit of early data. To summarize some of the pertinent takeaways, yes, there have been cases of severe thrombocytopenia post COVID-19 vaccines that are occurring, but this ex appears to be extremely rare. Um, thankfully, most people who had the severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccination responded to traditional ITP treatments, including IVIG and steroids. We will continue to hear about more cases of severe thrombocytopenia post-vaccine occurring as 1.5 million vaccinations are given per day. 
Our preliminary and early data in our own ITP patients, as well as the PDSA patients, um, seems reassuring. Although, again, we are limited by a small sample size, lack of data regarding the second dose of vaccine, and we don't have platelet counts available for all of our patients. It does seem like most people with ITP are doing well with a vaccine. Although we are seeing a handful of cases of platelets dropping to less than 30, we're not seeing high numbers of post-vaccine severe thrombocytopenia, nor are everyone's platelets dropping. So a few um, lingering unresolved questions are, one, uh, should you proceed with a second dose of vaccine if your platelets drop with the first? Another, can COVID-19 vaccines cause new ITP? If so, um, does this happen with all of the vaccines? And then three, if someone develops COVID-19 vaccine-induced severe thrombocytopenia, will this become a persistent and chronic issue or will it be a transient phenomenon? Um, unfortunately, again, unresolved questions that we, we have limited data in regards to. And just to remind you, as with all things related to COVID-19, there will be more data to come. So thank you everyone so much for your time. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Andrew, that was great. And um, Jeff, I'm hoping I could just want to show one slide just for interest before we open it up for questions and let Caroline moderate the questions. I thought it would be interesting because there's a group called Nate Babies, um, which looks for women who have made antibodies to their fetuses platelets and had babies born with low platelet counts and even rarely intracranial hemorrhages. And they were very concerned when they saw the New York Times article. And so they communicated with me about it. And I asked them if they could see what their particular experience was. And the bottom line is that in 52 women, nobody, they didn't all by any means me, uh, measure platelet counts or anything like that. But nobody was known to have a low platelet count and nobody had any bleeding. And I thought it was interesting because these are women who in the past have made strong antiplatelet antibodies, given that they're not the same type as ITP antibodies. So with just sharing that small amount of data for interest, I would like to turn it back over to Carolyn Cruz to moderate the question and answer period. Carolyn? Thank you, Dr. Bussell, and thank you to Dr. Lee, and thank you to so many of our PDSA members who were so generous to share their COVID vaccine stories on the PDSA Facebook page. And again, I encourage you to take part in our COVID survey um, so we can continue to track the responses uh, to not only the virus, but to the vaccine as well. Um, so you can find that on the PDSA website on the COVID page. Um, and Dr. Bussell, uh, just a quick question for you and Dr. Lee before we go to Dr. Seens and Dr. Gernsheimer. Um, Barbara submitted this question. Uh, she wanted to know, could the search to find a correlation between COVID vaccine and ITP possibly bring us new information about the origins or the causes of ITP? Uh, Andrew, if it's okay, why don't you let me take a shot at that first? I think the short answer is it would be very difficult. Um, as Dr. Permar mentioned in her talk, pretty much all vaccines can cause ITP at whatever rate they do. And because the rate is very low, it's hard to identify a high risk group of people, at least it's been so far, to see what's going on to say, oh, people who have X are the ones who get this. Furthermore, as um, Andrew commented, the patients are from all over the country, the ones who do get it and didn't have ITP before. So it's hard to study them and it's hard to study them before they get steroids, platelet transfusions, IVIG, et cetera. So I think it's gonna be very difficult, but I don't know, Andrew, Terry, Doug, I know Terry that you had a case in Seattle um, and by the way, Terry was one of the other sites that Andrew alluded to um, and provided some of the data for the pre and post vaccination platelet counts. Terry, I know you had the second case I was aware of and we're studying that person 
Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, yes. Um, so um, we, we looked pretty hard to see if we could find any kind of specific platelet antibody. Um, the, the patient had some very kind of non-specific antibody, our very first one that, that we looked um, that, that dropped her count very, very low, but did not have ITP. She um, dropped her count to two about 10 days after she had gotten the vaccine. Um, we um, looked to see if um, the vaccine specifically by adding it to um, the, the mix that we were using to try and detect an antibody, whether or not we could pick something up that way, we didn't find anything. Um, we didn't find any platelet specific. Um, so um, I'm not, you know, there was nothing we could really say that was special about her. She does have um, thyroid disease and has anti-thyroid antibodies. Um, and we postulated that maybe she is a quote antibody former, an autoantibody former. Um, but you know, we've since had two more patients, and there's nothing about them in looking at their antibodies or um, looking to see whether or not they previously had COVID to to explain to us um, why they did this. Doug, do you have any thoughts on that, or not really? Thanks. No, I think I, I think it's a little too complicated right now to. I think the techno. I think the tech. I think the assay systems are not sophisticated enough to address the, the question that's being asked. But I think I did want to mention. I did want to bring up a po another point. Um, at Yunju, uh, it might be worth mentioning when these patients were found to have thrombocytopenia after their vaccination, because some of them are within a day or two. Mm -hmm. and, you know, very few of them were actually over a time frame uh, where you can make a de novo antibody. And so the question always comes up now of, of cause or coincidence. And, you know, we assigned, you know, everybody is the vaccine is being responsible in every patient, but the timing of this makes it um, uncertain. So um, Jennifer posted on the PDSA Facebook page um, that IVIG and prednisone brought her 18 years of remission until she got infected with the COVID uh, virus. And so she's now finishing rituxan and hoping to avoid prednisone. So let's just start with that general question, uh, Dr. Seens, how can viruses or vaccines affect the platelet count? Oh gosh, <laughs> so in, 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 in 30 words or less? <laughs> yeah. So there are Let's some go, viruses go, that- Go from 200 or less. I'm willing mm -hmm. to hear more here. So th there are some viruses that affect megakaryocytes. And so the virus actually you know, damages the platelet or um, causes the platelet to circulate for a shorter period of time. There are um, some viruses that activate the coagulation system that consumes platelets. There are the, the there are vi there are vaccines like MMR in children, which really do seem to have you know a fixed incidence of uh, antiplatelet antibodies and thrombocytopenia a week or two or three after the vaccine is given. And then there's the, the, you know there, there are other things in the in the vaccine. There's there's RNA. There's uh, that lipid coat. There's polyethylene glycol. I mean there are other things to which people can make a and have may have pre-existing antibodies. And then the last, and then there's always the issue of simply inducing inflammation. I mean, you're developing an immune response, and so you're um, de you're you're developing inflammatory mediators that might uh, decrease platelet production slightly. And if you're turning over platelets at a fast rate, and you're hanging at thirty thousand, you go down to fifteen. You know that then you might you know you might develop thrombocytopenia based on a failure of compensation. Well, and, and I think probably uh, most of our patients have experienced after they get um, a flu vaccine, they drop their platelet count um, or if they get the flu. And that's probably associated with some inflammatory response that either causes <laughs> increased destruction of the platelet because the immune system is more active or decreases um, production. I but also think, I think we need to put this vaccine question into context. I mean, maybe it'll come up, maybe it won't come up, but you don't want to, natural infection can also cause thrombocytopenia. 
and a heck of a lot of other things. And it does it in more than uh, 20 out of 20 million cases. So, you know, we, we do have to, you know, balance the, the risk benefit here. And um, what is the, Caroline, I'm sorry, go ahead, you, Dr. Busson. Uh, uh huh. Um, I, I think, I guess I think like related to the infections and the other issues, because we see the similar type response with a number of different viruses and with the modified vaccine, modified virus in the vaccinations, there seems to be some kind of general process that can happen that I don't think we understand very well. And Doug laid out all the differences in there as far as um, ways things can happen. So it's almost surprising we don't see it more often. And, and the only thing I wanted to say, Terry, you said that when you get the flu vaccine, we often see the platelets go down some. Yes, that's true, but I thought one of the really nice things about the way that you and Andrew and uh, one other person collected data was, we saw the platelet count go up as often as it went down. And I think that was, even though the numbers were small, because it was a prospective collection instead of just the ones we hear about where it went down a fair amount. So let me tell you something interesting that we noticed um, in looking over some of our data and, we're, and we're, we're starting to ask some patients if they're willing to come in after just a day or two of getting the vaccine as well as a week. We started out asking everybody to get a platelet count a few days before they got the vaccine or the day of the vaccine and then come in a week later. And um, we've had several patients who, um, for whatever reason, came in a couple of days after getting the vaccine and they had dropped their count. And then when we picked them up a week, a week later, um, they had actually gotten better or some of them actually went up from where their baseline was. So I, I, you know, I think we, we, we're learning so much. And so one of my questions is, are we seeing a rebound? Are these patients actually dropping quickly after they get the vaccine and that by the time we're looking at it again, um, where um, are we seeing in a week, are we actually seeing a rebound um, after patients are responding to the lower platelet count that they have? I don't think we know. Yeah, Dr. Gernsheimer, these next two questions are related to your comment. Um, Sue wanted to know what the recommended platelet count is before receiving the vaccine. And then Mike wanted to know how soon after get a, getting COVID vaccine should folks with ITP get tested uh, for platelet counts? Um, do you want me to address that? So I, yeah. you don't need, a, I can tell you, the needles that they're using is teeny weeny tiny. It's a tiny amount um, that you're given. Um, so I think as long as your platelet count really is over 10,000 and you hold it with pressure, um, you can get this vaccine. Um, I don't expect it's going in a tiny amount. Honestly, it's such a, for anybody who's had it, they can, they can talk about that. It's just been a tiny amount. I don't think we really know when you should get a count. I mean, I'm, I'm getting counts more because I'm trying to learn um, than that I'm necessarily going to do something about it unless someone is symptomatic. So, um, you know, to a large extent, um, the patients are doing it also because they want to know, do I want to do something before I get my second dose? So as I was saying before, we're seeing that some people are dropping very early and then they're coming back by a week. Um, so um, I think we're still learning. And if you wanna get one a few days after the vaccine and then maybe a week later to see after your first one, because we're, we're gonna give, there's a few people um, that we're actually going to increase their TIPO um, drug before they get their second dose, just because they had dropped enough that we're concerned that if, that if they drop more on their next one, we'll, we could have a problem. Um, a couple of people who were on anticoagulation um, and then someone who dropped down into the twenties and we were a little concerned about her next dose because it was quite a drop for her. Caroline, could I make a couple of comments pertinent to this? 
I just want yes. to emphasize in Dr. Permar's talk that she brought up the reasons why, even if you had COVID, but if you didn't, you not only need to be vaccinated, but you need to get another dose. And this is especially true, it seems, as the variants start to become more frequent and some of them are a little less responsive to, um, let's say, standard dose of antibody or the same dose of um, antibody. And then the other thing I would like to say, some of the cases, as Dr. Lee described, we, the patients received rituximab. That's a perfectly, quote, good ITP treatment, but I think if at all possible, it should be avoided in this setting, not because so much of immune suppression in general, but so as not to wipe out the vaccine response, which it would do if it's given relatively soon after a dose of vaccine. So I just wanted to throw that in related to what um, Dr. Gernsheimer was talking about. Dr. Bussell, there have been quite a uh, number of questions uh, from patients who are on rituximab. Um, so if you've had rituximab, how long afterwards can you get the vaccine or will it be effective? Um, if you wanted to get it as early as possible, then I would say starting at three months after the rituximab, you would get your B cells checked monthly. That's a simple blood test using uh, an antibody to CD20 or to CD19. Um, and as soon as your B cells come back, you can get vaccinated. Most people that's between four to six months after. And Elaine sent us this next question. Her platelets dropped after the first dose of the vaccine and her hematologist put her on steroids. If she gets the second dose of the vaccine, will it be less effective due to the steroids? Terry, you wanna handle that? Um, you know, I think on low doses of steroids, I'm not really, um, worried about it. I think, you know, if we were talking about somebody who's, re you don't get that much immunosuppression on a low dose of steroids. I think Doug might might be um, better equipped to handle this, but um, I don't think that um, on a low dose or even a moderate dose of steroids, it's going to prevent you from having a, vac a, a response to the vaccine. Um, if somebody was getting massive doses um, and perhaps if it was combined with another immunosuppressant, I'd be more concerned. Doug, you want to say anything? No, about yeah, that? I would agree. I, I, I was been before I got on a, before I got on this webinar. I looked up um, recommendations from the MS Society, from the Rheumatologic Society, and 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 the and the, uh, the, um, the bottom line is the same that if you're on twenty or less of prednisone, um, you, you know, the, the, then um, go, go forward, go ahead, and the higher you go and the longer the duration of immunosuppression, then, then you begin to get into the unknown. It just hasn't been studied. But I, I agree that you know most most patients can will, will it appears as if most patients will develop a reasonable antibody response, notwithstanding a low dose of steroids, to the extent that's been studied. And we had a follow-up comment from an ITP patient uh, who said that their doctor told her uh, the vaccine probably wouldn't protect her because she's immunocompromised because she's on prednisone and she takes two point five milligrams once a week, uh, which I, of course I'm not a doctor, but I know is a very low dose of prednisone, having been on 60 milligrams a day myself at one point in time. Now that, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to get the, you, I mean, you, ha you have to realize if, if you're immunosuppressed, you need the vaccine and you need the second dose and you need to be able to get as much of a titer for reasons that you heard before. And I wouldn't hesitate at, at, at a low dose. I mean, even the even the transplant patients are being re it's being recommended, and they're certainly getting strong, you know, greater immunosuppression than than our most of our ITP patients. So that that wouldn't dissuade me in her case. We we could talk about rituximab um, because that that's, could a be, that's a story. That's a problem. That's an issue, and um, you know, follow. I have held off treating with rituximab. Um, right now. I don't use a lot of it, but I have really held off right now because for a good six to nine months and sometimes as long as 12 months after you have rituximab, you are not going to respond to a vaccine or have a very poor response to a vaccine. 
Um, and so um, we've told some patients they can go ahead and get it if they've just had rituximab, but we're gonna have to at some point down the line check titers and they may need to be revaccinated. And Dr. Gersheimer, how would you test their, their titers? Uh, because we did receive the question, uh, I've been on rituximab or for patients who have, uh, you know, uh, who are um, immune compromised and they get the vaccine, how will they know if it worked? Well, um, that's what Dr. Palmer was talking about um, earlier, that we don't have a good um, antibody test yet. There are some that I know of that some people are working on, but none of those are for prime time yet. Um, and so at some point, we're going to be able to look at people's immune status on a more routine basis and find out whether or not you've actually responded, just as she was saying with, um, with MMR every few years, if, or with people who can't remember if they had the MMR vaccine, we've got to test them to see whether or not they have a, they have a response. People are, are intensively working on that because I think it's so important to know how long your immunity lasts um, and, and what does a titer mean? How, how strong a response do you have to have to the vaccine to, to actually continue to be immune or at least um, um, have some immunity against the virus? Uh, Caroline, I would just wanna add to something that when Terry was just saying, I think many people can feel they're immunocompromised or immunosuppressed and I'm not disagreeing with that but I think the body is so adaptive and the immune system has so many different pathways that um, I think severe congenital immune deficiencies or high doses of multiple immunosuppressants, yes, you'll have a lot of trouble responding, but other people may well respond, perhaps not as well as somebody um, who's otherwise well, but well enough. And at least you can measure in your antibody titers, whether you've made some antibody. I 100% agree with Terry that we don't know exactly how much antibody you need and whether we're measuring the right antibody. But you could find out if you at least had some response, if that's what you wanted to know. And that would probably be useful, or at least would make me feel reassured if it was me. So we've received quite a number of questions from patients who do not have a spleen. Uh, I'm included in that group. Um, Rosemary sent us this comment. Her hematologist told her he did not know how many antibodies she would make without a spleen. Is there any data or reason why the vaccine would work differently in those ITP patients who have splenectomy? Doug, why don't you uh, champion this one as the master of the unclear circumstance? Okay, I've looked for data. I couldn't find data for splenectomy for sickle cell or, you know, autosplenectomy or thalassemia. I couldn't find any um, data uh, prior to this, this meeting, but my, I, I would be of the belief that there's plenty of lymphoid organs in your body left to make antibody. I mean, patients who've had splenectomy have been immunized against, you know, many different, with many different uh, vaccines successfully. And I'm, I, I don't know why this one would be any different. I think people are asking the question because we push so hard to make sure that people get their three vaccines before the splenectomy. Sure. Um, and, and, that's re and, and that's certainly reasonable. you have a better response. There's no question, sure. but. But again, if you're, if you haven't had a spleen and you don't have a spleen. I mean, all the, all the reasons that you could mount for being reluctant or, or worrying about the intensity of your response are all the same things that, that indicate why you should get a, a vaccine, including having had a splenectomy. So here's a question about treatment. My ITP is in remission. If I get the COVID vaccine and my platelets drop, should I be treated? And if so, what should be the treatment? Dr. Seen, do you wanna take that one? Well, whether you get treated depends upon, you know, like any other criteria for ITP. I mean, if you're having, obviously if you're having symptoms or if you have comorbidities and your platelet count gets down to what's what you and your doctor consider to be a dangerous level, then yes, of course you should be treated. 
but as you saw from the, the studies that were just presented, that's a min minority, fortunately, a minority of the patients with, um, with, who haven't had ITP and a minority of patients who have ITP prior to getting the vaccine. Um, and as Jim pointed out, or, or, or Yoon Jo pointed out, I mean, almost all the patients, fortunately, have been responsive to steroids, IVIG, and platelet transfusions. With rare, with very with rare exceptions in in a rare in a very low incidence situation, and we have lots of questions from patients who are on TPO agents like Promacta and Endplate, wanting to know if there is an added risk to them or if they should change the dosage in any way um, or alter their their course of treatment at this point in time. Dr. Grunsheimer, you want to take that one? Um. I, I don't think it adds any risk um, there. It doesn't um, at all affect their ability to respond to a vaccine. Um, I, the only patients I have changed any doses on, have changed the dosing on was a couple of patients who fell pretty low after the first vaccine. And so we're, and, and we wanted to increase it after the first vaccine and we're just gonna keep at that increased dose until after the second vaccine. But I think routinely, I'm absolutely not doing anything like that because I, I think people are going up as much as they're going down and we're just watching and monitoring. It, Terry, the only mm -hmm. thing I would add to that maybe is if somebody gets the first dose and their platelets do fall, even if it's not that dramatic, and they're worried about, oh, will it be worse with the second dose? If it'll be a little more reassuring to increase the dose slightly once or twice, no reason not to, in my view. Yeah, no, I, th I think that that's right. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not gonna hurt somebody to take an increased dose for a little while, starting with the second dose in that case, and to just make sure that it does. I mean, we just don't know right now, right? We don't know if people who fell are going to drop further with their second dose. We, we just don't know. We, we don't have those data yet. And that's, a, that's another plug for the registry that Caroline outlined and for people sending in their experience to PDSA because as you heard from Andrew's presentation, a lot of the data we have comes from people interacting with PDSA. And I, when, I, when Caroline sent the comments, I thought, oh, we're gonna hear from the one in 10 people or whatever the number was who had terrible experiences and they were gonna report how badly they did. And I was actually really pleasantly surprised and Andrew presented the data wonderfully that it really wasn't so bad. So are there people who drop? Definitely. But even within ITP, that seems to be pretty uncommon and there are things we can do about it. So I, I think, we need the info and there's stuff that can be done if you're unlucky or unfortunate and it happens. Well, Dr. Bussell, I think that's a perfect way to end this webinar. Um, before we go, uh, Dr. Gernsheimer, Dr. Seens, any final comments on your end? Get vaccinated. Get vaccinated, unless you have, unless you are the rare individual who has active, untreatable, you know, really the worst of the worst ITP, you, you don't want to get COVID. Yeah, get vaccinated. Stay safe and get vaccinated. I mean, well, I thanks mean, to all our- Monitor, that's fine. Monitor if, you, if you're concerned, of course. And talk it over with your doctor, of course. But, but don't avoid the vaccine. I mean, you, you don't want to get COVID. It's not going to help your ITP. Yeah. If you want, right, if you want to get a count before and after vaccination, if you That's want to fine. boost your treatment a little, anything that will make it work for you should be okay. But the, the not getting the vaccine in general is going to be worse than getting it. Agreed. And uh, okay. Caroline, before you thank everybody, could I thank Dr. Lee for really doing a great job putting all that data together in what I thought was a very comprehensible package to Dr. Piramar for finding the time in her schedule to give such a nice discussion of the vaccines and how they work. 
to the sponsors. Um, I think it's Nova Argenics and Principia for helping to support the webinar. Got to have a shout out for Jeff again, and a thousand percent a shout out for PDSA. This never would happen without you. And you, Caroline, as the face of PDSA, have been absolutely amazing in helping to coordinate all this so we can all learn about what's going on. And that's why you're such a great co-host, Dr. Boussel. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 a, and a big thank you to Dr. Boussel because he's the one who helped me uh, coordinate this and get the experts uh, to present this, uh, this information to all of you out there. And uh, again, thanks to all our expert guests for joining us. And we recorded um, this webinar. So check the PDSA website later in the week. And if you missed any part of the webinar or you'd like to watch it again, you can check back once again. Uh, and it, once again, another plug for the COVID registry. Um, we will continue to monitor the situation along with the PDSA Medical Advisory Board and uh, issue updates where it is warranted. And uh, this is a first uh, in a, a series of ITP Insights webinars. So please check the PDSA website often um, so you can see the other topics that are coming up in the future. And thanks again to our sponsors, Argenix, Dova, and Principia. Uh, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you.